Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for today's webinar on the impact of ACAD on the aviation industry. I'm now going to pass you on to my colleague, Frank Dowling of DMS Government. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Ali. Um, and I would like to, to welcome everyone to our webinar, um, which is based on the potential impact of ATAD on the aviation industry. And um, before we commence, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, there are quite a number of slides um, that we will be going through in our presentation today. These will be circulated uh, to all at attendees uh, following the webinar, so no need to take detailed notes or anything like that. Um, so without further ado, um, I would like to welcome um, our presenters. Um, we're very pleased to be joined by Brian Brennan, a tax partner in KPMG Dublin with a specialism in aviation. Furthermore, we're also joined by Seamus O'Cronin, who is a senior finance partner in a &L Good Buddy, with a long history also in aviation. And finally, David Morrissey, who, will, who is a managing director in DMS and head of our client solutions team, um, will also be making a presentation on what a potential uh, structure would look like. And finally, my colleague, Niall McNamara, who is, should be well known to most of you, who is joint head of the Structured Finance Division in DMS, is also on the panel. So, as I said, the topic of today's webinar is the impact of ATAD on the aviation industry in Ireland, and specifically the imminent introduction of interest limitation rules in Ireland, probably commencing uh, January 2022. And who better to talk us through these changes than Brian Brennan from KPMG? So, Brian, would you like to um, kick off, please? Thanks, Frank. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, I'm just going to cover the interest limitation rule today. Um, essentially, the Anti-Tax Avoidance Directive, which is otherwise known as ATAD, was uh, signed into law uh, by the European Commission in 2016. And essentially, the purpose of it was to try and take a number of the BEPS measures, uh, which is part of the OECD and G20 project, and have some level of conformity within EU member states. So that was the whole purpose of the EU ATAD. And one of the measures in the ATAD is the interest limitation rule. <clears throat> So under the terms of the ATAD, what it provided for was that the interest limitation rule was to be implemented uh, by all EU member states no later than 1 January 2019. However, they did allow for a deferral uh, to up to 2024 where any particular member state had equivalent measures. Ireland applied to the uh, EU uh, to uh, seek a deferral of the interest limitation rules to, to, to 2024 on the basis that we do have equipment measures with respect to uh, payment of interest to non-residents. However, uh, after lengthy correspondence with the European uh, Commission, it was decided that um, Ireland did not have equipment measures. So then they sought for Ireland to implement the rules uh, as early as possible. Now, given that this correspondence only took place you know, primarily during 2019, um, we, we couldn't uh, adhere to the uh, directive to have the legislation in place from 1 Jan 2019. So at the moment, we're working through the process um, uh, with government, and uh, it's likely that the legislation will be implemented by 1 January 2022. If we could turn over just to the next slide, and I'll explain a little bit more detail on the timeline. So as I said, the interest limitation rule is effect, was meant to be effective from 1 Jan 2019. However, uh, we sought to defer till 2024. But um, as a result of the process with the European Union, we now are looking potentially at an effective date of 1 January 2022. What needs to happen in Ireland uh, is that the Department of Finance are planning on having a consultation, uh, which hopefully will be launched later this year, uh, which will run for approximately maybe 12 weeks, which will talk through the various legislative measures and what impact it's going to have on various sectors, including aviation within Ireland. If we could turn to the next slide, please. So just to run through very quickly the basics. So what, what do the rules provide for? The rules provide for a, a limitation or a restriction on your interest expense uh, equal to 30% of your EBITDA. So if your interest goes above 30% of EBITDA, that interest is restricted. The restriction applies to both third-party and shareholder debt. And as I said, the main basis 
um, of these uh, rules is to avoid base erosion, i.e., where companies have you know, basically they're fully debt funded and they're stripping the profits down through interest expense payments. As I mentioned, there's going to be a consultation which will run for approximately 12 weeks and that process will uh, take place whereby the Department of Finance will engage with industry bodies, with professional firms, industry representatives, etc., to get their views on how Ireland should implement these rules. And, you know, one of the things about this is, like, at the moment, we already have a number of provisions under Irish law to deal with interest expense deductions. And some of our rules are quite complex. And the simplest way for the Department of Finance to actually implement these rules is to delete all our existing legislation dealing with interest expenses and limitations. I just bring in a simple rule that would say all interest expense should be deductible subject to the 30% limitation. And there's a lot of, you know, um, various terms set out in the directive which we're going to have to enact into law and as I said part of the consultation will be looking to uh, see how best to implement those provisions without having an adverse or negative impact on any sector in Ireland. As I mentioned the interest limitation rule would have a significant impact on capital intensive industries like aviation. If we could turn to the next slide please. Yeah, so um, what, what are the impacts of this? Well, number one is the impact on the group effective tax rate, because if you have a restriction on the amount of interest that you can claim a tax deduction for, it means there's going to be a higher level of taxable profits that will be subject to tax. Uh, the timing, uh, you know, it has an impact on, well, when are you going to pay cash tax? Uh, so it actually accelerates it uh, for a number of different uh, entities or groups. Um, compliance, the, the, the compliance uh, for companies is going to get far more complicated because number one, they're going to have to conduct the calculations to determine if they have a restriction. Then if they have a restriction, they need to see, well, what's carry forward? Because there's rules that allow you to carry forward restricted interest to, uh, to uh, future periods. There's also rules um, around where you've got excess interest capacity and you should be able to carry that forward. So your tax computations are going to get far more complicated um, going forward uh, with, you know, uh, with the introduction of this new rule. The final point worth mentioning then is just on the modelling impact. So for any transactions, be it an ABS transaction, securitization, etc., um, the offering memorandums will always have a model setting out, well, what's the projected profits and uh, cash tax payments for a, a particular uh, structure. Um, with this new rule now, that's going to add more complexity to those calculations, and it's going to take, going to be, it's going to take longer to actually prepare models for uh, these type of transactions. Can move to the next slide. So. On the interest limitation rule, what we're saying is it's a limitation on the amount of interest that you can claim a deduction for. But like, what, what, when we talk about interest, what are we talking about? Are we just talking about the mere coupon you pay on loan borrowing, or what does it include? And under, under the terms of the directive, um, what it provides for is that, like, you know, the things that are caught would be profit participating loans, so any interest on those loans, uh, interest on finance leases, capitalized interest, transfer priced interest. FX movements on interest. If you've imputed interest, for example, that would be caught. If you have a deemed interest under Sharia finance rules, that would be caught. Amortized interest, uh, notional interest, and guarantee fees and arrangement fees. So as you can see, the, the meaning of interest is going to be very, very broad. Um, so it's going to catch a whole pile of you know uh, items in your PL. It's not just going to be your interest expense, as I said. There's a whole pile of different other items like guarantee fees, FX movements, arrangement fees. Um, they're all going to fall within the meaning of um, interest uh, when you're trying to calculate your net borrowing costs. If we can and, move... Uh, sorry, Brian, just yes, Brian. From, from that point, um, and I particularly noted the previous slide where you talked about the compliance the compliance cost. In an industry where it is not unusual for more, there to be more SPVs than actual aircraft, I think that that is particularly interesting. Um, but particularly on this slide here, where you're, you're talking about net borrowing cost. Um, can you allocate some income against that, Brian? And what type of income could you um, apply? Yeah, yeah, exactly, Frank. Well, when we talk about net borrowing costs, ultimately what you're talking about is um, my interest income less my interest expense and the net surplus. So if you have a surplus, it's that surplus that will, will be subject to the restriction. 
Um, so like if you're in a scenario where you're loss making, for example, and you're, you end up in a deficit, well, in that scenario, you don't have a restriction. But when we talk about interest income, like at the moment, obviously we don't have law at the moment, so it's slightly challenging. So you have to look to the directive, but the directive is actually silent on interest income. So um, there was a prior consultation on this back in uh, 2018. And uh, in our response to the consultation, we highlighted to the Department of Finance that we need some level of consistency here in that if the meaning of interest expense includes all the items I just referred to here in the slide, well then, Similarly, the meaning of interest income should include all of those. So you're comparing like with like. So you're not in a scenario where you're trying to compare apples with uh, oranges, you know? So, so for example, um, and particularly with relevance to the aviation industry, um, operating leases would not be included in the net borrowing costs. But if you have a loan interest income or finance lease income, they would be included in that overall determination. Would that be correct? That, that's absolutely correct, Frank. Yeah, and like it's interesting when it comes to operating leases. One of the points we raised in our uh, response to the prior consultation was that, you know, when you're looking at uh, operating lease income, at the end of the day, a lease is essentially akin to a form of finance for airlines, and in a lot of cases, there is an implicit interest rate built into the lease. So what we've said is what the should look to try and do, which is in line with IFRS 16, is try and bifurcate the interest component uh, to the capital component, such that if you are uh, an operating lessor, you can actually, when you're doing this calculation, you can strip out the interest component out of your operating lease rentals and compare it to your interest expense when you're doing that calculation. Understood. If we move to the next slide. so. Under the, under the directive, it does provide for um, some certain exclusions. <clears throat> so uh, these would be items that would just completely fall outside of the interest limitation rule. So the first one is if uh, your net interest expense is less than three million euros. Now, unfortunately, this rule would apply on a group basis. So um, it, unfortunately, I'd say a lot of groups, you know, um, particularly groups that are capital intensive, that would have high uh, um, amount of debt leverage, it's just not going to apply to them. Uh, standalone entities, uh, there's an exclusion for standalone entities. Again, these are entities that just are not consolidated into the uh, accounts of any company uh, globally. Uh, it doesn't have any associated entities. It is a pure, as I would call it, a securitization type vehicle. Uh, if it's a standalone, they're excluded. There's also an exclusion for pre-17 uh, June 2016 loans. Now, one might ask, well, what's the relevance of such a date, like the 17th of June 2016? That was the date that uh, the directive was signed into law by the European Commission. Um, so what they're saying is if you had loans in place before that, they apply for an exclusion. However, the directive says <clears throat> um, there must not be any modification to the loan, uh, to those loans. And that, that that certainly is going to lead to a lot of questions. Uh, this is something we've looked at uh, an awful lot in practice with, with other interest uh, provisions under Irish law. Like if you, for example, change the interest rate on a loan or you ex ex extend the term to maturity um, or you, you make an amendment to payment dates, is that a modification to the loan that, that breaches this rule? So I, I'm not sure, I hope a lot of people will actually be able to rely on that particular exclusion. Um, but time will tell when we see what, what sort of guidance the Irish Department of Finance and Revenue will give on uh, modifications to loans. The final exclusion I'll refer to here is financial undertaking. So where you've got like, for example, groups such as banks, insurance companies, pension funds, uh, fund undertakings, AIFs, for example, there's an exclusion for those type entities because they're regulated entities. Uh, so they're required under regulatory rules to have a certain amount of regulatory capital. So, you know, the, the European Union is kind of saying, well, these aren't groups that are actually really and truly uh, base eroding through high interest expense because uh, under regulatory rules, they're required to have a sufficient amount of regulatory capital on their balance sheet. So that's why there's an exclusion for financial undertakings. Next slide, please. There's also an exclusion for a group ratio rule. And basically, the, the purpose of this is to, what they're trying to look at as well. When you compare your standalone entity um, how, uh, to the wider group, what does your interest to your uh, EBITDA ratio look like or compare with the group? So the first one here, the one that says that it raised the cap to the same ratio as the group's interest on third party borrowing to EBITDA. So if the, um, basically, if the, the, the ratio for interest on third party borrowing is higher from a group perspective, Basically, they'll allow the single entity to uh, to raise its 
uh, interest expense capacity to that particular exposure or that particular level. The other one then that they look at is basically your equity to assets ratio versus the group ratio. So in this particular test, if for example, the, the SPV has a, a higher um, equity to assets ratio compared to the group, then you basically you're allowed to have a complete exclusion from the interest limitation rule. So there are two exclusions, but the, 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 the challenge you're going to have with them is like the complexity in trying to work out those calculations uh, on a group basis and on an annual basis. So you might find you meet the test one year, but you fail it another year. And how is Irish revenue going to implement these rules in practice could be quite challenging, <clears throat> but there'll be more to come on that. Um, next slide, please. The other uh, provision that the directive provides for is there's options to allow you carry forward any unused uh, deductions. So let's say in a scenario where your actual interest expense for the year is 100, but based on your calculation and the 30% limitation, you're only allowed a deduction for 75. Well, you've got excess interest there of 25, and the directive allows for you to carry that forward. Now, it gives you three options. We've pushed for um, the Irish Revenue to implement option C, uh, and what that provides for is that you can carry forward uh, any unused deductions indefinitely. It's similar to our rules for tax losses. We can carry uh, forward tax losses indefinitely. The other thing with this rule as well is it allows you to um, carry forward any unused interest ca capacity for a five-year period. And what I mean by interest capacity is this. When you run your calculations, and if you determine, well, I've actually got interest capacity of 100, but I actually only have a borrowing of 50. My interest expense is only 50. There's excess capacity there of 50. So you can actually carry that forward out of these rules for five years. And we will be looking for um, uh, the Irish um, Revenue and Department of Finance to uh, implement those rules uh, to, into our um, domestic legislation. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So I just want to illustrate the impact that this rule is going to have on companies. And I, I've got two examples. Uh, here that we'll go to. And these are two companies that are just standard trading companies. So if we look at our facts, right, um, we've got a, a company here that's bought an aircraft for 50 million. It's got a lease rate factor of 0.7. So it gives it a, an annual lease rental income of 4.2 million. We've got book depreciation of 1.7 million. In the first example, we've got a senior debt of basically loan to value of 75% with an interest coupon of 4%. So, and the other thing we have, we've got operating costs of 100,000. So if I look at the calculation uh, under the heading trading company one, we run down to, we have our uh, rental income, depreciation, our external funding costs, our operating costs, and we have a profit before tax of 900,000. So the first step you have to do is, well, firstly, determine my EBITDA. So EBITDA in this example is pretty straightforward. It's lease rentals, less your operating costs, which is 4.1 million. Then you got to determine, well, what is my allowable interest expense? So 30% of my EBITDA, that's all I'm allowed to take a deduction for. So here that gives us 1.23 million. And if I compare that to my actual interest expense, which is 1.5 million, it means I've got a restriction or a, an amount of disallowed interest of 270,000. The tax effect of that at 12 and a half is 33,750. If I look at my other example here on this page, the only change is that we've decided to introduce some shareholder debt. So we've got, um, we, we continue to have our 75% um, external debt, we've got 20% shareholder debt, and then 5% equity. So with the additional shareholder debt, it increases our interest expense in the example here by 650,000. And if we, you look at what my EBITDA is, it's the same as in exa the first example. My allowable interest is the same as 1.23 million. However, the amount of disallowed interest I have is far higher. It's 920,000 here. And that's purely because of the fact that we've introduced um, interest on shareholder debt. So the anomaly here is that the higher the amount of leverage that you have, the potential uh, higher amount of a restriction that you have as well, unfortunately. Because um, in, in the first example, we had 25% equity on the balance sheet of this entity, which meant that the amount of restriction that we were uh, suffering was lower, so it was. If we move to the next example. That's quite interesting, um, Brian, that example. That's particularly in relation to how you're going to uh, structure uh, SPDs going forward in that scenario. Exactly, Frank, yeah, uh, absolutely. Like, where you've got, you know, other entities within your group that um, 
may have excess borrowing capacity or excess interest deductions, etc. We you would like to think that um, <clears throat> we we'd have provisions that allow you to move those um, uh, tax attributes between group uh, group members. But uh, obviously, uh, the devil will be in the detail when the legislation comes out on that. You know, but it, but it is interesting how. how the restriction that this can have now for some groups with aircraft they might say well what does that mean because i've got losses carried forward because of the tax depreciation on the assets but what you'll find is your um the the, the period in which you start paying cash tax will actually start happening a lot sooner uh because with the interest restriction you're actually eating into your tax losses so your pool of tax losses will actually start diminishing uh, a lot faster than what we would have today for example the final example I'm just going to walk through here is just for a Section 110 company. Now, as everyone would know, the difference between a Section 110 company and a trading company is that a Section 110 entity is entitled to an interest deduction for profit participating debt. So if we look at our example here, the facts, very similar to what we had in the first example. Um, the only difference is that we've um, got 25% of our funding is basically profit participating debt. So when we look at the calculations that I've done here, we see we've got our lease rental income of 4.2 million, accounting depreciation 1.7, external funding costs 1.5. I've got shareholder funding costs, which is my PPN interest of 890,000. And we've come to that number because what we've said is we're going to leave a profit of 10,000 in the company uh, on an annual basis, operating costs of 100,000. So again, work out my EBITDA 4.1 million. My allowable interest is 1.2 million. One, sorry, 1.23 million. But when I compare that to my overall interest, been my senior interest and my PPN interest, my restriction is a lot higher, which is 1.1 million. But uh, more importantly, the actual tax effect of that is worse because a Section 110 entity, as we all know, pays tax at 25%. So the the, the tax leakage in this particular scenario is far worse at 290,000. And um, that's all I'm going to cover off uh, uh, on my presentation today, um, and I will hand over to uh, Frank. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, we could have extended that for another 10 or 15 minutes with some questions that were coming to mind on that, um, but we'll leave those for another day. Um, certainly, it's going to be um, challenging, um, and it's going to mean the management of tax losses um, is going to require, require a lot of attention um, to make sure they don't get trapped trapped in SPVs. Again, thank you, Brian, uh, for your um, very detailed overview. Um, in terms of the um, imminent introduction of ATAD and the interest limitation rules, and they have yet to be legislated for, so we are not certain as to their final impact. Um, but one concept that has been uh, topical in recent years has been um, the use of an of a aviation fund in either Ireland or, or Luxembourg, but in this instance, we're focusing on Ireland. So we're looking at a potential regulated uh, aviation fund. And who better to, to ask about how he would see that working than my colleague, um, David Morrissey. Uh, so David, would you like to take us through uh, your experiences and how you would see this operating? Yeah, thank you very much, Frank, and a good day to everyone. Um, I suppose to Frank's point, obviously today we have a number of aviation funds already in existence. Um, they're either established as uh, Irish uh, qualified alternative investment funds or indeed as Luxembourg uh, reserved alternative investment fund. And we can touch on both of them momentarily. But really, we want to try and demonstrate our experience to date and try to make this process as transparent and as easy for those listening in to learn from the experience of what we've seen to date. So as I've mentioned, most of the funds we've seen historically have either been Irish regulated uh, funds established as qualified alternative investment funds. Um, in Luxembourg, it's a reserved alternative investment fund. It's small technicality just to point out that the Luxembourg fund, uh, although not regulated officially itself by the CSSF, um, it is seen as a regulated structure from a European perspective because all the service providers are actually regulated. So both vehicles can actually avail of the AIFMD passporting mechanism. And this is the key issue for particularly clients that may be looking to raise capital from a European institutional market and certainly one we've seen many of our clients to date uh, experience from. Both of these vehicles are well established and well recognized from an investor's perspective with the quaves that's the acronym used on the Irish side, being in existence since 2012, 
and the Luxembourg rave structures being in use since 2017. Next slide, please, Ali. Uh, just as you're moving on to that slide, uh, David, why is there particular reasons why you would choose one jurisdiction over another in terms of Ireland versus Luxembourg? Yeah. Th th thank you, uh, Frank. That's a good question. Um, the reality is that you know the jurisdictions are, are relatively equal uh, when you look at it from a, I suppose, regulatory perspective. But the reality is investors will always have their own preference or certainly a perceived preference on one jurisdiction over another. As it stands today, one of the big benefits that Luxembourg has over Ireland is the ability to establish their fund structures as a limited partnership. Um, with the evolution and the development of the RAVE vehicle in 2017, I would say, frankly, nearly 90% of the funds that we establish today in Luxembourg are being established as Luxembourg Reserved Alternative Investment Funds and being established as a limited partnership structures. Unfortunately, in Ireland, we do not, as it stands today, have a limited partnership vehicle. It is typically established as an ICAF structure, which is a, a the equivalent of a corporate vehicle that has been specifically designed uh, for investment funds by the Irish uh, regulatory authorities and one that is used widely uh, across the world. So from an investor's perspective, if they have a preference to be uh, utilizing a, I suppose as a limited partner in a GP model, then they have a tendency to go towards uh, Luxembourg. However, if a, you have a, what I would say, an investor who's quite comfortable with being a, a shareholder in a corporate structure, then they would typically uh, default to the Irish structure. Moving on to the, the key features, I mean, the reality here is when we're looking at the funds, that the, the fund structures themselves help satisfy uh, from a substance perspective. Uh, again, uh, the idea that you when you look at an unregulated vehicle, um, that is something that they have, I suppose, fallen foul of, and particularly be find as an issue or a challenge. Uh, as a quaif structure, when we look at it from an Irish perspective and their regulated status, they are exempt from tax on both the income and capital gains arising from the activities within Ireland and Luxembourg. Again, uh, we anticipate that they can make distributions to non-residents and investors are free of any Irish withholding taxes. Again, this is something that many corporate institutional investors will already be leveraging up globally, particularly when you look at some of the large pension funds from a European perspective and indeed institutional and family offices from elsewhere. Um, so it's a, it's a well-trodden path and a path that's utilized quite widely today. So really, I suppose from where I would sit, Frank, the aviation industry is actually benefiting from something that's already in existence. Next slide, please. Continuing on with the benefits, again, when we talk about it from a fund manager perspective, there are some key issues here which I want to highlight. Um, again, the use of these structures, you can actually, going back, you can access larger pools of investor capital. As I've already mentioned, the fact that these vehicles are being utilized by institutional allocators from across the continent, um, again, allows them to expand what they can invest in these asset classes that historically they would not have been able to do. And what I mean by that is historically, a lot of institutional investors what is being allocated to these asset classes through unregulated structures? They could have been securitizations or they could have been simple SPVs. By having them in a regulated fund structure and under uh, the AIFMD regime allows those institutional investors to invest in these regulated fund structures under the safeguard from a European regulatory perspective. In doing so, it's actually cheaper capital as well. And the investors are committing to a longer term, uh, I suppose, horizon in their view in allocating capital to these kind of structures. This is something that we've seen in other asset classes, and we've begun to see it in the aviation uh, pools today as well, and how it's actually structured. And sometimes I think also it, important. Sorry, David, just for cut, sorry, cut, but something that I see of relevance in this instance is often in the funds uh, sector, there's reference to closed-ended funds as opposed to open funds. Perhaps you could just detail the difference and why I think it is something that would be of interest to our audience. Yeah, no, I agree, Frank. Uh, Closed-ended vehicles are typically where the investor is committing to give capital to the fund structure for a period of time. Now, closed-ended vehicles can range in any from three to five years. Uh, and, and the longest I've personally seen has been 12 years with an option of extending it for a further two years. And what the investor basically is saying is that, listen, he's handing over 
um, his capital investment to the manager, to the fund structure, on the basis that they're going to have a yield being returned to them on an annual basis, or that they'd have capital appreciation over that period. That's something, again, within this asset class, I think is very appealing to some of your clients today. With regards to open-ended vehicles, it really is probably more what I suppose uh, aviation people would see with securitization products, products where there might be a, a, an individual note or issuance listed on a particular stock exchange. And again, an open-ended vehicle will have some sort of liquidity requirements in there where capital could be required to be returned to the investor. Again, it might be as frequent as on a monthly or quarterly basis, but typically again, when these asset classes we've seen historically has probably been on an annual basis. So the benefits of having a closed end structure are something that, again, I think that would be very appealing uh, to not just investors, but also to the managers as well. From, that's from a, a manager or the lessor perspective. When you're looking at an investor, you have to ask yourself, well, why are they looking at these structures and what are the perceived benefits to them? It does come back to the whole origin of AI FMD and why that was brought about. And the reality is that it was brought in from a regulatory perspective to protect investors within mainland Europe. The bottom line is that within an AIFMD structure, the assets should be segregated and effectively ring-fenced for the benefit and the interest of the investors within the fund. So as such, if something was to go wrong with the fund, if there was an issue with the fund, the service providers that are there are there to protect the interest of the investors. And again, I'm not going to get into them here momentarily, but you have things like the management company and the administrator and depository whose fiduciary responsibility to safeguard those assets is actually enshrined in the legislation and basically is, have an uncapped level of liability associated with it. Again, if I'm a European institutional investor, a pension fund, and I decide to deploy 100 million into this fund, as long as the fund adheres to its investment strategy and delivers on what it was supposed to deliver on from a management perspective, again, I shouldn't have an issue. But if there's a problem with fraud or if something was to go awry with the fund structure itself, then as an investor, I have that level of protection under the AIFMD legislation to fall back upon. It's something that, again, that we've seen significantly grow over the last eight years since AIFMD was brought in, with many institutional investors now, from a European perspective, only being permitted to invest in these structures. Moving on from an investor perspective. Sorry, Frank, you going to ask another question? I was just going to interject that it, that is a very important point and the role of the custodian. And I know it's something that Seamus will touch on uh, later on, um, but it is it is something that should give the investors um, a high degree of comfort. Um, but it is yeah. an important structuring point as well. Maybe just as we move on to the next slide, we will touch on this point briefly, because uh, I know if there's other uh, partic panelists, participants who will reference it as well. The, the, the key service providers with a, a fund structure from a European perspective, I've already mentioned the management company, um, you then need an administrator and depository. And I suppose to give everyone in the audience reassurance, this is something that DMS does day in, day out for many of our clients globally. So we're well positioned to pull this together for you, utilizing our partners at ANL Goodbody and indeed at KPMG and other key service partners to ensure that we have all of the service providers in place. Um, the management company has a, an oversight requirement, uh, an obligation for an investor's perspective. The administrator obviously is there to do the official books and records of the fund. But to Frank's comment about the, the, the term depository, or historically you might have seen it listed as custodian, um, is key. The depository is there to, as I've mentioned already, ring fence and safeguard the assets for the investors. But I know it's often the question that comes, in, comes up with lessors uh, in regards to the title of the aircraft. So the aircraft will be held through an SPV structure itself, uh, typically a, a, an Irish Section 110 entity, but there's no need for the actual, uh, I suppose, title to the aircraft itself to change or to be impacted in any way. Ultimately, all the depository wants to make sure of is that the asset itself and the financial benefit associated with that asset, whether it's its disposal or ongoing income, is there for the benefit of the investors in the fund. And again, there are various mechanisms that we'd be happy to delve into at a later date, or uh, if anyone has any questions, they can, can come directly to us and to walk people through how that solution will actually work. All of the other key service providers are listed out there in the schematic on, on, on screen. And again, from a DMS perspective and our different service partners that we work with, um, it's a relatively straightforward model. Please do not get alarmed on how all these different entities may appear. But I suppose the assurance we want to give you and indeed our clients today is that we're well positioned to be able to manage this for you. 
I think on the deposit requirements, I've already touched on that. Um, next slide, please. And I suppose this again is probably more for our service partners involved, uh, because certainly one of the big challenges has been how the depositories get comfortable with this asset class. Historically, and I have to be quite candid on this, many depositories would look at aviation assets as something that was beyond their comfort zone. And I mean, from a DMS perspective, we've spent a long time working with our clients, but working with the leading depositories to make sure that we can give them that comfort around how we'd be able to support the business. So as you can see there, there's not just uh, you know aviation assets, but there's other types of assets we can include as well. Again, we look at, I suppose, evidence of the ownership is key for us from an aviation asset perspective. We look at the register extract, the share certificate or the profit participation note. We obviously have to monitor the bank account. And again, that's just part of the uh, ongoing uh, approval process from a depository and reconciliation of the cash flows across that. And then we look at the individual aircraft, back to back bills of sale and verified international registry and aircraft registry, et cetera. And that's all done by the DMS aviation team. And then the final segment on that is in relation to the aviation or aircraft engines. Again, uh, verifying and checking the registry just to ensure that from a depository perspective, there's nothing untoward and that they can rest assured that the assets within the structure itself are actually being held as they should. Thank you, back to Frank. Thank you, David. Um, that's, I think that should give people a good overview of how a typical regulated structure uh, works. Um, clearly the introduction of the tax legislation in 2021 may have an impact on how that, that is structured. Um, but it should give you an understanding of, of the key parameters. And it is something that DMS has, has a long history in. Um, so uh, as David has illustrated, um, it is something that is workable. Okay, so we've had an overview now of the, of the um, tax considerations and potential structure that um, uh, can be implemented. Um, in terms of the, the specific structuring considerations from a tax perspective, we have, um, as I said earlier, Seamus O'Crony and for me and Al Goodbody uh, to present his views and his considerations um, of items that to consider as you go through this process. Great, thanks very much, Frank, uh, and hello, everybody. Um, so, uh, just following on from from Brian and David, uh, what I'd like to discuss are some of the legal and, and general structure and considerations around the use of a regulated aviation fund. And I'll use uh, RAF or RAF as the as the acronym just there for the purposes of this presentation. And you know, probably where I'd start from is, is that you know it's very clear from Brian's slides that the new ATAD limitation rules you know, are going to present some challenges for a number of Irish aviation structures. They are very complex rules and there will be a lot of analysis and a lot of considerations to take into account as to what structures may be implemented and how we may change structures to address those rules when we see them in their final form. Uh, and of course, we're considering uh, 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 an RAF in that, in, in, in that context, but I think it's probably important to, to look at it in a wider context as a very interesting new potential aircraft holding structure that I think for a number of reasons, and David has touched on some of them, I think will become increasingly popular um, uh, in the coming years. Um, I think probably first just to, to, to mention, and I think it, it, it is something that has to be mentioned, obviously when you are dealing with a regulated structure, uh, the costs of establishment, the timing for approval of the central bank, um, you know, those costs will be higher, that timing will be longer than for an unregulated structure. Um, but as David has explained, you know, there are very material and substantial rewards in return. Um, I'll cover some of them later on, but I think one that certainly is worth underlining is the potential access to new pools of capital and new investors. And certainly, um, if there's been one story in the aviation space over the past few years, it has been uh, the increasing number of new investors looking uh, to take some exposure uh, to the aviation sector. Uh, and I think uh, these funds are very interesting development in terms of uh, bringing in new uh, uh, groups of investors who are used to investing in regulated fund structures um, and, and marrying that um, with some exposure to, to aviation. Uh, I probably would add, and just kind of uh, in terms of that uh, trend, uh, we certainly are seeing regulated funds becoming more and more popular. Um, 
uh, in many asset classes, but specifically they are being used in particular uh, by private equity firms to hold investments. Um, and we've certainly seen those private equity firms move from other asset classes into aviation and are beginning to see the use of these regulated funds uh, to hold aviation assets alongside other private equity investments. So definitely um, that trend is already well underway. So perhaps then uh, I could move on uh, to maybe some of the sort of key structure and considerations that we would see at a very high or general level um, when, you, when you're thinking about establishing um, a regulated aviation fund. And, and I think you know, a couple of key points to mention here. I think first of all, uh, and again, coming back to the phrase I've used, exposure to aviation assets, I think in the, in, in the modern uh, aviation world, I think there are a lot of investors who are happy to take exposure to aviation assets in a number of different guises, whether it's the metal, interest in a trust, interest in a company, uh, an aircraft loan, or aviation bonds or aviation secured or unsecured paper. So I think one very important point, and again, uh, uh, our colleagues in, in DMS and, uh, and KPMG um, can, can assist you in this regard, is very much making sure that your, your fund structure does build in flexibility as to the type of air aviation assets that you want to invest in. And in particular, I would probably highlight aviation loans as an important point here. And uh, you know, if you are looking to originate aviation loans as well as acquiring interest in, in, in aviation assets, I think it's very important to ensure that you have the necessary flexibility in your sub funds uh, to make sure that they have uh, within their constitutive documents the ability to make those investments. I think probably the second diligence point, and again, um, it, 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 it's probably coming into contact with an increasing trend in the aviation sector is the level of control over the assets. And I think you know, David has explained uh, how regulated funds work. Obviously, there is a need for a regulated uh, fund manager. That manager can delegate certain tasks, including day-to-day -day administration, to unregulated third parties who can be related with the sponsor. But there are certain functions and uh, certain key functions that need to be retained by the manager or delegated uh, to regulated entities. Uh, and in that regard, I think it's very important in the aviation sector that investors and managers focus on the level of control over their assets and how that will work on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think um, that control can be developed through the matrix of contracts around the regulated uh, aviation fund, um, but it does require some focus on board representation, um, the management arrangements and the delegation arrangements. And I would probably say that aviation expertise in relation to your manager and the choice of your manager is extremely important in that regard. And I would also suggest the ability of a manager and a custodian um, to interact and liaise in a practical manner, uh, you know, which, which, which ensures that the assets are managed properly. Uh, that is also very, very important. Um, and I think probably the last point I'd make here is that um, this is, in the aviation space at least, a new product. And I think if you are a manager or an investor and looking to bring this to other counterparties, such as lessees or lenders uh, uh, or, or other third parties, I think it's reasonable to expect that there will be some diligence required to explain the product, uh, to, to share the incorporative uh, constitutive documents and the, the formative contracts, and really to explain the key terms to these customers. Um, I don't see that as a particular challenge, but I think it is worth making sure that you have that diligence in mind and when you're preparing your contracts and you have your information packaged in a manner that can be shared um, in, in a format and of a type that can be easily understood uh, by those counterparties, whether lenders, lessees, uh, or other third parties. Um, so moving from the high level considerations then just to some of the operational considerations, always a very important consideration for any Irish aviation holding structure, uh, how can the assets be managed? And I think the key point here is that whether uh, you hold aviation assets through the regulated uh, aviation fund itself or through Irish subsidiaries, as, 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 as David and Brian have both mentioned, um, I think in, in, in either case, we are still dealing with an Irish company. And the good news is, is that all of the usual basic corporate rules as to structure, approval and execution of documents, entering into contractual arrangements, they will all apply to the Irish uh, regulated aviation fund and to its subsidiaries. Uh, there is here, uh, for this type of structure, the overlay of the management agreements. Um, but I would probably suggest that the management arrangements, by delegating power to a manager, may facilitate um, simpler execution processes. And by that, I mean, um, unlike perhaps some regulated aviation structures, in this regulated aviation fund structure, the manager is far more used to assuming responsibility for key decisions. And that potentially allows the fund 
uh, the, the, the company, which is which is effectively the, the central fund vehicle, to delegate more authority to a manager who can make decisions without constantly having to refer back to the board, as would be the case with an unregulated structure. So that is something, it's probably an interesting question and something that 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 that, that might be considered in terms of these sort of structures. And um, however, I probably would flag um, that you know we are dealing with an aviation world that has a very set way of doing business. And it's likely that board resolutions and powers of attorney will still be required by airlines, by tax authorities, by lessor, by lessees, by lenders. Uh, so you know, we do have to prepare ourselves to deliver those documents, but that still can be done within a, a, a regulated aviation fund. I think two other small points to mention. Um, as, as many of you are aware, uh, there is a Central Bank of Ireland registration requirement where an unregulated fund uh, enters into finance leases or lending activities that does not apply for a regulated aviation fund. It would apply to any Irish subsidiaries, but if the regulated aviation fund already has KYC processes, it should be a relatively simple matter to extend those uh, to the subsidiary. So probably uh, something that's probably an easier issue to handle um, in the regulated fund structure. Um, and lastly then, and going back to a point David made around um, substance and the substance requirement that has been created through the CBI regulator sorry, Central Bank of Ireland regulated fund, there is an interesting question here as to whether that may, in certain circumstances, assist uh, the double taxation treaty uh, residence analysis with foreign tax authorities, where one can point to the fact um, that this is a, a financial institution of sorts, which is regulated um, by the Irish Financial Services Regulator. Um, not something, I think, where there's been any practice established at this stage, but probably an interesting space to watch um, as uh, the use of these funds becomes uh, more popular. Uh, just very quickly then to finish just on finance considerations, um, obviously in relation to these structures, third party debt is a very important consideration. I think it's important to note that you can use insolvency remote structures with these regulated aviation funds. You can set up orphans, which will then sell e-notes or other instruments back into the funds. Uh, I think we will need um, uh, uh, to carry out probably a more detailed uh, related company insolvency analysis if you're using subsidiary companies to borrow uh, money from third parties. Um, but there are structures already in the marketplace in the unregulated space, and they are becoming more common where lenders are happy to lend into structures which have an element of ring fencing, um, but are still within an overall group. Uh, and I think certainly the regulatory element of this fund structure may give some comfort to lenders in that regard. I think the other point that's worth uh, mentioning, and I think David touched on it earlier, is that uh, these fund structures are specifically designed to protect investors and to segregate their assets um, from other sub funds and from other claims unrelated to the fund itself. And those segregated cell provisions, I think, are another interesting development. We don't have them in the unregulated fund structure, which may be of interest uh, to, uh, to both investors and to lenders. I think lastly, just some other points on finance, just to finish, and um, some smaller points. I think obviously if you are dealing with third party debt, it will be necessary to consider what the consequences of enforcement are. Uh, if you are using the fund directly, but also in relation to subsidiaries, if an appointment of a receiver or similar officer charged with enforcing and realizing security is, is appointed, you know, what consequences will, will that have for the structure? And uh, that is a, a point again, which I think can be worked through, but it's important to just, to, just take into account. Uh, and I think then just lastly, some, some smaller finance points. Um, obviously, Irish regulated aviation funds can make Cape Town filings and can benefit from the new uh, Aviation Working Group GAT system, which is, of course, this new trading system whereby aircraft will be placed into Irish uh, law trusts or indeed Delaware uh, or, or Singapore trusts with the beneficial interest then being uh, traded electronically. So all that optionality is available to these funds and their subsidiaries. And similarly, uh, although there is a different mechanism for filing security interests similar to US UCC and the Irish CRO Form C1 mechanism, uh, there is a separate mechanism for regulated aviation funds, but it's not materially different in any respect. However, security filings are required in relation to the funds, and that does help in terms of giving lenders and third parties some visibility uh, in terms of the interests um, uh, that have been created or security interests that have been created by the regulated aviation fund. So um, I think just to, to finish on that point, uh, probably a very interesting development in the aviation space and um, some considerations, both general and specific and operational to take into account, but very much an interesting development and one uh, that I think we'll see um, a lot of developments um, 
on in, in, in the coming years. Thank you. Thanks, Seamus. That was um, very informative um, and probably confirms our, uh, the sense from, from many of us that it, it is a natural convergence of, of two sectors for those of us that have been involved in the aviation finance space for many years and potentially now um, the, the, the fund sector. So one, one item that I think when you look at these structures that, that comes up regularly is, is the role of uh, the depository and how they um, perform their tasks and their, their duties. Um, we have met many of them um, in, in Dublin um, discussing their role in, in terms of aviation. Seamus, from your side, from the, from, from the legal perspective, um, and in terms of them getting comfortable with the, the, the I suppose, the, the existence of the assets, um, do you see any, a specific challenge um, with aviation assets as opposed to, say, real estate um, with similar um, with leases associated? Or do you, do you anticipate that it will, it will involve a similar process? Yeah, Frank. I mean, it's 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 a really interesting question, and and, and perhaps for for those of us, you know, in the aviation sector, um, you know, and and coming into contact with the regulated fund sector for the first time, this is a new concept that you have a, a depository or custodian who is charged with maintaining some sort of oversight and control of the assets. Um, but I think what's really interesting is I think that you know the industry uh, probably has quite a lot to offer to to satisfy those concerns, and I think in particular some of the developments over the last. 15 to 20 years, I think specifically the international registry um, and the ability to, to search, uh, I think as, as, as was mentioned in David's presentation, um, for a chain of title in relation to assets but, and, and also in relation to leases and security, I think is of real value. Um, I think also uh, just that the general management of these assets you know, under existing rules and practices in the aviation sector um, you know, does lend itself to quite positive engagement with, with custodians and depositories in terms of you know, displaying control of, of, of the key technical records uh, and also in terms of monitoring uh, the, the, the aircraft, its maintenance its, and, and it, its movements as well. So, so I think all of that, I think generally, to my mind, um, I think I would be pretty confident that, uh, you know, there's a lot there that can be used to, to satisfy depositories and custodians. Um, I, I think there's probably two interesting points here um, and to touch on something you said, I think the most important uh, exercise here will really be to educate depositories and custodians as to the nature of the asset, how it operates, what the considerations are, uh, what the control points are. Um, and I think in that regard, uh, as I said in my presentation, um, a, a custodian or slash depository who is comfortable with the asset class and who has taken time to understand it um, in terms of engaging with the manager, I think that's really important and I think that should be a very important factor for anyone looking to set up a fund here to make sure that the, 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 the depository slash custodian does have that necessary expertise. And um, I think probably one other point that's worth making is um, there is an interesting convergence here um, with the new uh, AWG GATS system. Uh, where beneficial interests in aircraft will be traded electronically through trust arrangements and probably an open question as to whether perhaps uh, some of the trustees who are going to be working within the GATS framework may now start looking at perhaps fulfilling depository or custodian roles as well. Um, where those two are separate, um, uh, you know, so far as far as I'm aware, I don't think depositories and custodians are looking for their own form of limitation or restriction on the asset itself. Hopefully that will continue that way. But I would say in other asset classes where we've dealt with depositories and custodians, you know, we have managed to work out very workable solutions in terms of how depositories and custodians exercise their control over assets, principally in the real estate sector. Um, and those arrangements have become fairly standard and I think are quite easy to put in place now in relation to real estate financing. So certainly there are good precedents out there, but I think you know a, a depository or custodian who has taken time to understand the asset class and indeed you know a manager who's taken time to explain it to the depository custodian i think that's going to be really important going forward and, and that's a really good point uh, seamus they you know we have taken the time in dms to go and meet with some of the depositories and they have shown real engagement on on this process um, we expect them all to um apply their their own specific approach in getting comfortable um but there has been a real engagement on this 
um, which can only be beneficial for the industry. Um, so I think the key message is, this is a potential structure that um, can work, but it will depend on the specifics of the legislation to be introduced in 2021, and also will depend on the specifics of e and facts of each particular structure um, that is envisaged to be put to be implemented. Um, but it is going to be a fascinating area, and for the aviation industry, it is anticipated to be um, an area of much consideration in the coming 12 months. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Uh, that was a very informative webinar. Um, if anyone has any questions for any of the attendees, um, then you're very welcome to contact them directly, and we'll make sure that everyone is furnished with a copy of today's presentation, including all of the panelists' contact details. Thanks for joining.